rewilding urban areas. Joining us today is Adam Kamal from Tropical Rainforest Conservation and Research Center, TRCRC, who will be talking on examining ways to conserve and reintroduce native trees, native trees in the city. So um, Adam Kamal is a conservation biologist by training and is currently working as a project consultant at TRCRC. Adam graduated from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point with a Bachelor of Science in Biology, concentrating on vertebrate and vascular plant ecology and evolution. He is passionate about outdoor recreation and finding viable solutions to the biodiversity crisis. His interest lies in rewilding degraded ecosystems and bringing functional forest ecosystems into urban environments. That is all from me. I'll be passing the stage to Adam Kamal. So Adam, uh, whenever you are ready. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, glad you guys can come out at eight o'clock on a Friday. It's gonna be a real wild one today. Um, well, yeah, we're live from the exact opposite of a forest, concrete box. And uh, I'd like to start off this talk not by going straight into urban forest, but rather let's talk about the history of wilderness in Malaysia. Unfortunately, I'm focusing on peninsular Malaysia because this is where I do most of my work and most of the research. And like I said, I'm a biologist. So when we put that conservation and conservation biologist, it means that I'm focusing mostly on the uh, life and natural aspects of things. Conservation is, of course, an extremely interdisciplinary science. It requires people from every background and I've been really lucky to work with a lot of people from different backgrounds. So let's jump right in with the history of wilderness in Malaysia. So the history of wilderness in Malaysia started out with a very long period of stability. I believe the number is around 160 million years, followed by a short period of time of tragic land use. Um, just to look into Malaysian rainforests, it's just a wonderfully diverse and complex ecosystem. 2,830 species of just tree um, found throughout several different ecosystems which are in Malaysia. And of course, like the main ecosystem that's here is the Lola and Diptychart Forest. And at one point it blanketed 69% of peninsular Malaysia, which is an astounding number. It's over half of this entire lovely country. And well, that number does not remain exactly today. And we'll go in and examine why. So I get to ask ourselves, um, what happened to wilderness? I mean, like uh, it's 2020, we all love trees, we love nature. We're like, starting the, the next revolution, right? But land use in the past has been a chaotic and turbulent, a turbulent series of events. That original 69% of the lowland diptocarp forest shrunk 41% and is remaining now at about 28%. And on top of that, there's only 6.8% primary rainforest left. And that 6.8% is, you know, guarded in Royal Bloom and Tamanagar Pahang and Endo Rampin. And the rest of it is in some sort of flux as we are using the resources from the forest. And I mean, conservation biology is about finding that balance of using those resources, which is a, an incredibly complex thing, get a complex thing given the ecology of this place. So they started to use more, how do you say, holistic practices in logging. And a lot of these practices originated from countries like where uh, half of me is from. Uh, so they used selective timber management where they went in and they only removed certain patches of the forest thinking that if we do that, we can get the forest to recover quickly. However, Diptor carp forests and temperate forests are very different things. Um, and this comes down to the period of stability in its evolutionary history. So 160 million years of existing as a blanketed moist carpet of awesomeness. And 
that allowed the trees there to have a very interesting disturbance regime. And we talk about disturbance regimes as uh, the natural cycle at which things kind of die and grow back up. And with these, these forests, the cycle is like a canopy gap regime where a single tree reaches a point far past its maturity, maybe a few hundred years. And for our more intense species, it could be up to a thousand years. I'm looking at you, uh, Bellion, Ironwood, and uh, Neobonocarpus aimei, Chengal. And uh, so that canopy gap regime is pretty sensitive. Uh, a lot of these species are sitting in the understory, like we have these emergent trees and they're like only a couple meters tall, just sitting in the understory, biding its time and then something happens, termites, fungus, and also, and then it's just this race, this competition of photosynthetic arms race to get to the top and kind of fill that canopy gap back in. But when we go in with heavy equipment, with chainsaws and uh, we start chopping away at that we are not we basically kill off all of those understory trees that are kind of waiting to fill the canopy gap we disturb the soil a ton uh, like really badly and sometimes it gets cut down and you have this little barren patch of forest and uh, that barren patch of forest if it is uh, too big or not near some sort of seed source it kind of just dries up and then becomes this really bad laterite. Uh, this kind of like term for soil that's been baked in the sun for too long. And we know that, uh, especially today, it's been raining all day. That rain causes this really severe leaching effect. And uh, all the resources, all the nutrients, the inorganic and organic nutrients that's sitting on that soil gets drained away. And we're left with laterite, like I said. And laterite takes a long time to go from that back to a secondary forest or belucar. And secondary forests are not primary forests. So that transition from laterite to secondary forest could be 10 years, could be more. And then it could be another 10, 15 years until we get a secondary forest. And then it could be another 50 to never to get a primary forest again because there's no seed bank. There's no seeds in the soil. Most of our seeds are recalcitrant. They either germinate, get big, or they get attacked by fungus or frugivore or mouse or something else, or someone steps on it, or someone's walking through the forest and it's like, oh, cool seed, pulls it out. And uh, because there's no seed bank, other things can invade, like ferns. And uh, we have this really particularly interesting species, the Dicrinopterus linearis, the false bracket fern. And, I battle these things all the time. They are extremely, extremely hard to get through. And what they do is they kind of grow and dominate and they add biomass and organic material and it, it makes the, that little lush area perfect for them. And then they just keep growing and it's basically halt succession. And so we're slowly saw that 69% of lowland diptocarp forests get degraded and turn into secondary forests or have succession halt completely. And uh, so that's the history of wilderness in Malaysia. And uh, hopefully I got the point across that we've lost so much forest as it is. And now one of the cool kind of upcoming hip solutions is to try to take those species that existed in the forest prior and bring them in. And then understand first why that hasn't happened. I think we need to go through the history of urban landscaping in Malaysia. And uh, this is really interesting to me because I have no idea about urban landscaping in Malaysia. I've been jumping between Malaysia and the USA my entire life. And I got really lucky this year and well, <laughs> kind of lucky in COVID, but really lucky to work with not one, but two landscape architect students. And one of them, Amira, was so kind to do a lot of research into getting me up to speed with what happened in the uh, history of landscaping in Malaysia. Um, so let's jump into that. Urban planting in Malaysia has mostly focused on aesthetic qualities. It's, we're trying to be a garden city. You know, gardens are cool, they want pretty, flowers, things are in order, things are neat. They're kind of like runways for cars and stuff, you kind of look out and see cool things. 
And there was three main phases in the history of this development, this urban planting development. And it started uh, all the way back prior to independence. It's not that far back in 60 some years, right? Uh, but the British were like, oh, we need trees. And they chose a really interesting species. So these are the three phases, the colonial area, the dawn of the greening program, and the one that we're currently in, the 2020 idealism of being a garden nation. So let's start with the colonial era. And they brought in like one of my favorite species. It's a legume, it's Pterocarpus indicus in Malaysia. It's known as Angsana. In the Philippines, I think it's known as Nara. And it's this just gorgeous tree. I mean, like just gorgeous and big. And it's got these big leaves and it hangs down. And it's a wonderful shade tree. It's got this beautiful papery bark. And I'm super happy they planted them. And they planted them everywhere. They were just, they were cutting, they were cutting stems and just propagating left and right. And uh, this caused quite an issue because imagine if you only have a few trees and you try to make a lot of trees from a few trees, you're not going to have a lot of genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is like still kind of an abstract concept, but essentially what happened is that they created a huge population of a genetically narrow um, gene pool of a single species. And so we get things like the Angsana leaf miner. It's like this little moth. Yeah, just goes, goes to town on leaves. And then we had something called Fusarium oxysporum, which is a fungus. And well, it just caused an epidemic with these trees. It was just wiping them out. And uh, so it kind of fell out of popularity in about the 1990s. And uh, this would have been a great time for them to replace this one cool rainforest tree with like, a lot of cool rainforest trees, but it didn't happen. And let's jump into that. And so they did use a lot of native trees. And I'm, like, I'm not saying there isn't native trees here. I'm, every time I go on my commute, I'm on a little motorcycle, I'm driving down the road and I'm, I'm seeing Hopia odorata. And I love seeing Hopia odorata, but most of the time when I see Hopia odorata, they're not doing great. They're kind of spindly or they look a little sick or they're not happy. Um, cause it's a rainforest tree and they planted it in a row and every time there's too many leaves, they're just like, oh no, there's leaves and it's not pretty anymore and they rake it off and well, we'll get into like why that's bad later, but they started planting native trees that are a lot of times from a coastal forest, um, coastal species are tough. You gotta be tough. You're getting sprayed with salt, you're getting wind, you're getting, you know, inclement weather, strong winds and rains coming in and. Uh, a lot of these species are tough and they survive. So it does make sense why they planted them. Like if you want to have a low maintenance, pretty tree, these are your species. In fact, in front of my house, it's all Sejum Grande, which is a, either Jambu Laut or Kalat Jambu. I really apologize to everyone that I don't know my local common names all that well. I'm, <laughs> I'm from a uh, temperate background at first and I came here and let me tell you, the diversity is another level. So trying to rewire my brain to learn all these names, plus trying to pronounce and learn local names has been quite a challenge. And so we have these like three species you can see up there, Calaria, Atroperpia, Sejim Grande, and the Yellow Flame. I don't want to butcher that name right now. And these are really popular. You can still see them almost everywhere around the roads today. And then after that, they started introducing non-native species as well, like Cassia fistulata, Swintinia macrophylla, and Caia singalensis. Uh, the last two of those are known as mahogany trees. They're like different kinds of mahogany, and they are super common here. And they're big, and they're beautiful, and I love them, but I really wish that we would see some more of our rainforest trees because that's, our his that's the history here. That's what the characteristics here. And uh, another issue with some of these trees, especially kaya, is uh, maybe their root systems aren't as well adapted to the thin soils of this paleotropic uh, area. And they, they tend to do a lot of this. So that's like the introduction of the colonial period. They also started making parks and they started adding in a lot of green spaces. But of course, a lot of times the parks were landscaped to be of an aesthetic value. They wanted trees to look pretty because trees aren't pretty on their own, right? I'm kidding, trees are gorgeous. So let's go to the phase two and this kind of came about 
when Malaysia started to have its independence and making its own decisions. And, uh, they, they started out by wanting to really bring greenery to the concrete jungle, which is great because I'm sitting in a concrete box and I'm not having any fun. So I'm sure if we had no trees on our urban streets, we wouldn't have any fun either. And so they did a lot of extensive tree planting, a lot of landscaping, mostly inside of the roads, mostly in rows, mostly of trees that were arbitrarily chosen to be pretty. And a lot of those popular trees where, once again, we have a reoccurrence, Caracarpus indicus, cool tree. And then Samania Saman, cool tree, but not native. Cinnamomium inners, wild cinnamon, kind of native. It's more of like a blue car species. Sometimes you find in the primary. Cool tree, good choice. Spontaneum macrophylla again. Delonyx regia, red flame, non-native. Another legumiaceous tree that's hard to kill. Has nice pretty flowers. Boring, right? Uh, Mimosop elengi, which is, I don't know too much about that one. And then Lager stromia speciosa, which is a semi-coastal tree as well. Um, but the idea was to look pretty and be pleasant and break up the concrete jungle and, you know, make mortars less angry in the road. And I think that it kind of worked. And uh, so there was like a few more five interesting points of this. Like I said, roadside planting was number one. Planting in public parks and open spaces. Once again, for aesthetic value, planting along the highways and expressways. This one's kind of an interesting idea. They, I know they, they planted a lot of tectonic grandis on the Utaras Latin Highway. Um, Teak, Lamiaceae, South American as well. Did not do well, <laughs> really did not do well. If you're driving up and down the road, you see these trees with big leaves, they kind of squat, they look bad. They don't belong here. Uh, and then they also focus on planting within industrial areas and housing estates, that's just good. And also developing in the city that picture is funny because it's mostly palms. And palms aren't a tree, they're monocots. Don't call them a tree. And then phase three, this is like where we are at now. Um, we're going towards a garden nation and this talk is about derailing the garden nation idea and making it a forest nation. Let's bring back urban forestry. But a garden nation is a great start. And uh, so they, really did a lot of work here. And they, you see here that there's a lot of different acts that came out towards this. And this was driven by various stakeholders and we'll get into the stakeholders at the end, but for now, let's just think about the history. So Garden Nation. Uh-oh, there we go. Okay, so now let's think about some issues and difficulties. We got the plan right, we had the intention. Uh, they had all the, the good guidelines and stuff, but once again, not everything is perfect as is normal. First thing, like I've been saying, it's a focus on landscape aesthetics as the forests aren't pretty. And then there was a lack of enforcement of the Tree Preservation Act. Some guy in a big tractor would drive over a route that was like four meters from the tree, not thinking anything of it. And then a few years later, that tree dies and goes, and then everyone's like, what happened? Well, they didn't enforce the rules and regulations and guidelines that were already there and it caused a lot of mortality. And then also this improper pruning and care, like people seem to not fundamentally understand that plants can't regenerate themselves endlessly. They grow from merit stems. And uh, if you cut the merit stem, everyone's having a bad time, especially the tree. So let's jump from difficulties and let's think about biology. This is where I like to talk as if I don't like talking already talking too much, I feel like. But let's go with the habits. A habit is just like what the tree looks like, right? And in order to understand trees in Malaysia, we need to understand their habits, why they came about, how they work, and their relationships. And so I'm in TRCRC, and we have this really wonderful emphasis on diptocarps, and diptocarps are super cool. They are beautiful. Their, their branching pattern is, and their leafing patterns alternate and they have these little stipules that are always like recurved and they're just gorgeous. They invest a lot of energy in their leaves. Their leaves are thick and coriaceous and really cool. And uh, they also have really interesting inter intraspecific and interspecific relationships, especially with fungus. They have these mycorrhizal fungus that are thriving in the soil and it is a two-way relationship the trees shading out the soil and dropping their leaves increases the humidity while decreasing the temperature of the soil allowing the fungal species to absolutely thrive and when the fungus thrive the tree thrives and so the fungus are 
proliferating through the soil, grabbing all of the inorganic nutrients it can and some organic ones and like expressing it to the tree and then it goes to the tree and the tree trades it some sugars that it created to photosynthesis in exchange for all these little <clears throat> vitamins and minerals that the tree so desperately needs. And you get this really beautiful relationship and uh, if you've ever been in the forest here and you're just kind of like dug around in the soil, you'll just see the forest floor like looking for all that good nooch. And so that is potentially an issue when you want to bring in native trees because you can't just landscape them. They, they need these relationships. They evolved in the presence of each other. And now after 160 million years, they need each other. And uh, they also evolved with other trees and they stratified and they, but I can't say strategize because they're, they don't actively know it. You know, evolution occurs in populations, not individuals. Uh, and they stratified into these like, kind of like we simplified this a lot. These three main layers, like we have our emergent trees. These are like, these are our trees. Like, these, are, these are the sexy trees. They get big, they're huge, they're awesome. You're like, every time you see one that's like mature, you're like, whoa, big tree. You're like, uh, we could see this tree on the left here. This is the world's tallest tropical tree. I got to visit this with my boss, Dr. Zymon, and uh, it is so cool. When I got to the base of that thing, I was just having a great time. Uh, anyway, that layer is made up of a lot of big trees, and it can be up to like 50% dipterocarps. And so just keep that dipterocarp in mind. And then in the main canopy stratum, this is the, all the trees that are kind of like in between that fill it up. They're like the blankets the blanket over the soil. Um, these are really important to you. Sometimes we call them canopy non-dominance and uh, they're really, really cool trees as well. They are not to be left behind. And then finally we have the lower layer and the lower layer, like they're shade tolerant. And uh, let's get into it some more here. So if we go from the bottom back up, the understory layer, that bottom layer, it's actually comprised of a lot of the saplings from the emergent and the main stratum. Like they, uh, the, all the big top trees kind of drop their seeds, all the seeds germinate as quickly as they can or get it eaten by like mammals and birds and small reptiles and stuff. They reach like one or two meters and they just chill there for a very long time. So uh, this is an interesting thing because when we go into secondary forest, sometimes we get something called a post logging remnant. And uh, I love those things because when you go back into the forest 20 years later after disturbance, sometimes your little post logging remnant of two meters has now become like a 30 meter gigantic, almost mature emergent tree. And you just feel happy like, oh, you escaped. So happy. Uh, and moving from, and they have like a lot of different families. Okay. And, and one of the things that I can't move past this layer without talking about is our climbers. Um, we have some ridiculous climbers here and like they they have this really cool strategy of like being in this like shaded area like biding their time getting enough resources and then just shooting to the top and uh as much as i like them sometimes i hate them too because uh, especially the ones from the palm aca family they uh they get spikes in the dewey dewey and i actually had one like tear a chunk of my ear out uh yeah i was chasing after a frog and made a mistake so there's tons of climbers climbers from all sorts of different families, but the dominant ones are from the palm family. And you know, they're the ones you can think of, the rattans, and there's also the climbing bamboo. And if you go into a blue car forest, what happens is that these, these like uh, palm climbers and stuff, they get released. Uh, there's no like big shaded overstory layer. So there's uh, not a lot, of, there's a ton of sunlight coming through now because this layer is gone. And uh, they're getting all this good nutrients from the soil and they're getting all this sun. And so they just grow abundantly. And yeah, that can be quite frustrating when you're working in a secondary forest. And so going up, once again, let's go to the main stratum. And they are from a variety of families, but I think my favorite two families are actually three. The last three are like my favorite ones, like the Myrsticaceae, the Myrtaceae, and the Sapotaceae. The Sapotes are cool. The Myrtaceae are cool. All the Cisium, like the, I just love Cisium trees. They, they have some of the most interesting bark around. And then the Myrtaceae, sometimes they get big too. I've, I've been really lucky to see some giant ones like Myrstica Maxima. I love that name, Maxima. And then let's go back to our dominant species. These are the really, really cool ones. 
And you can see there's a lot of different genera, but we don't have a lot of species listed here because oh, there's just a lot of species. And if you're a biologist, what even makes a species? Like, is it the reproduction? Is it molecular? Or like, is one species different from another? If it's got too much of a molecular difference, like the species thing can be quite complex. And uh, I think it's also highly localized because of how much time they've had here. And the fact that a lot of like, for instance, our dipter carps, they're very poor at dispersing. Uh, I believe that once they find an area that's really, really good, they kind of want to keep all their prodigy in that area, all their little saplings, because they know it's good. They get that good microbial uh, system going on there. Those mycorrhizal fungus are already there. Everyone's happy. Uh, another famous tree that we should mention is like the Diera costulata, the uh, Apostinaceae family. 75 meters, huge big tree. And then we have our gluta species. Those are the trees. If you chop it and get it on your skin, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, other ones worth mentioning is all of our legumia, legumia species, our fabaceae, like our instia, instia palambanica, our compostias, which are also known as tualongs and syndora. Uh, the instia palambanica is now our national tree. I uh, won't debate that choice. It's a, it is a choice, but it's now our national, national tree here. And then we, I want to talk about Sindora because uh, the Sindoras that I've seen are so cool. I was just walking through the secondary forest, ran into like one of those old post logging remnants. And uh, it's just a huge bowl, this huge stem and uh, no buttressing roots at all. Just straight from the ground, one circle, flying high into the sky. And uh, they're just really neat. Uh, I ran into one called Sindora echinocalyx and the seed pod is spiky. So you get this little cool legumia seed pod and there's just tons of spikes all over it. So that's like the biology and the composition of most of our layers. A lot of this comes from the intense studies done on Passau Forest Preserve. Passau, I can't remember how to pronounce that, but a uh, really cool place. If you can read the papers about that forest. Uh, so if we go back, actually, sorry, let's go back. Let's look at the picture, ignore the content, right? Look at the picture. That's all we want to see. And we'll see like, you can actually kind of tease out some of the layers. Every once in a while you get a tree that pops up. And then if you look deep down, you can see some of the main stratum. And then uh, let's go to the, let's simplify that. So let's jump forward. And uh, yeah, so this is just the structure. You have emergence, you have your main stratum, you have juvenile cheese, palms, et cetera, et cetera. And then actually, if we look at the diagram on the right, that was done in partly between Dr. Hales and Dr. Mike Cavana from WWF in a paper called Bring Back the Birds, which basically is a super cool guideline into bringing forests back into the urban environment, which is exactly what we're talking about, right? And so at the bottom there, you can see a top view. And in my mind, that looks way more beautiful than a line of like, just one species, right? So like these kind of things we need to think about and start bringing into the mainstream landscaping area or landscape architects take note. And then another thing that we always think about because everywhere we walk in the city, if you walk in the city, there are roots are always doing damage and they're like ripping off sidewalks or they're like going where they shouldn't or you get like a ficus, a fig tree that like sends down a crap ton of roots and then you get just punctures and causes all sorts of infrastructural damage and we have to ask ourselves, like, why is this happening? Well, it's because tropical soils, especially paleotropical soils, are quite poor. Uh, all of the good actions happening in the top layers. So the trees, of course, need to take advantage of that. And so once again, let's go back to Pasta Forest. That's what this image is from. It's one of those papers. It's a root dynamic paper. And uh, we saw after digging up some of these trees that the tap roots only go down like two meters. That's nothing. Like if you have a 50 or 70 meter tree and the tap root is only going down two meters, that's incredible. Which means that all of the lateral roots is what's causing all the, the tree to be able to hold itself up. It's like pulling the tree on all sides and keeping it erect. And then all those lateral roots are spanning over the forest floor, like trying to acquire all that good nutrients. Nutrients, good nutrients, nutrients. And uh, so obviously if you put those trees in an urban environment and you just place a sidewalk on the ground where all the good nutrients, is, you're gonna have a problem because the trees will grow and that will cause an issue. And they found that some of these trees can have 
over 10 meters of roots of like main primary roots spanning around its base. And uh, if we're going to start to bring urban trees to the urban or native trees to the urban environment, we need to think of some really novel and unique ways to deal with that. And I think that is worth doing. Uh, and we've seen from the species list of urban trees planted that a lot of those trees are in the Fabaceae family and Fabaceae roots are interesting. They, they tend to have these little nitrogen fixing nodules, which are like little apartments for bacteria that fix atmospheric nitrogen. And they can be really good for mediating with poor soil and to also just increase the bioavailability of nutrients in the soil in general. So let's move away from that. And uh, let's just talk about microclimate again. I've talked about the soil and the duff layer and all the nutrients being there. Well, what keeps that nutrient cycling is having all of those leaves on the ground and having the canopy protecting it. That promotes the um, fungal species and the bacteria to be able to decompose the leaves and recycle the nutrients. And the leaves also prevent the water from taking that nutrients and sending it straight to the river. And uh, that is really important to get. Like we, we just need to be able to let go and let the duff layer be if we're going to bring trees here. So that means like no more obsession about raking all the leaves away. Like just leave them. Oh, it's a live photo. That's a little secondary forest. See all the palms and the duff layer in the soil. It's kind of cool. And then uh, also when we're doing tree planting, we should be paying attention to creating habitat. Maybe some of you here are, are here not for trees, but for animals, but guess what? No trees, no animals, simple fact. So uh, we need to be paying attention to the natural layers and the fact that a lot of our canopy and our emergent trees, they like to be close to each other. They like to grow in clumping patterns because they are ecosystem engineers and together they create the perfect space for them. Uh, and even space in the trees just doesn't appear natural, nor does it function the same way. So if I give this talk and then some crazy revolution happens and we're planting emergent trees in all sorts of places and we're planting canopy trees straight down the road and it's just a row of normal trees, I'm just going to be sad. We need to have diversity. We need to have layers. We need to have that entropy that makes forests forests. And I put this picture on the left. This is the road into Malia Basin. Um, just look at it. It's gorgeous, right? When you're driving through that, you can just be happy and not worry about your commute. So once again, I want to kind of take away that idea that only trees planted in roads in a straight line are aesthetic. No, this is aesthetically pleasing. Biodiversity, biophilia, it's a thing. It's aesthetically pleasing. And it's also more than aesthetically pleasing for animals. It's their habitat. Not just like food, like nesting material, places to sleep. Uh, if you're a small bird and you're escaping a larger bird and that larger bird's escaping a snake, they can do that here. They can't do that in a single tree. Uh, now we talk about biology, we talk about problems, we talk about history, we talk about wilderness. Let's talk about solutions. Uh, so like I was talking about, we need to have strategic planting. Um, I get it that we want parks to be of design for humans and for people, sorry, for people, right? And that is okay, but we can mix both. Like we, not every single person utilizes the entirety of a park. Like we can find, we can use really cool GIS technology and satellite imagery to find good corridors that are close to other forest patches and in, in the corners in that area or in the middle even. We can have little patches of like really dense um, plantings to mimic rainforest diversity and complexity and layers. And in between that, you could put your cool native species and nice pleasing arrangements and have areas of picnicking or you can, you can do both and we can do both. And it just takes, like I said, a good old strong interdisciplinary effort. Uh, we need to support our stakeholders at the national landscape department. Like they are driving for native trees. Um, they did put some caveats in there, like uh, when necessary or when possible. Uh, and we just need to push, push, push and say that like, it's always possible. Um, and that it can be done by making people just, you know, appreciate the rainforest species here as the characteristics of being here and part of our history and part of Malaysian identity. And uh, it can be really good. And National Landscape Department and FRIM are working hard to find species lists that work for the urban environment. And uh, that's great, but I still think that maybe 
we need to go back and think about how can we adapt to them as in the trees? How can we adapt our infrastructure and our needs to fit, uh, the, to fit the forest complexity so that we can have both because the trees aren't gonna change. Like I said, once again, evolution occurs in populations over generations. It doesn't happen in individuals. And if we want to actually use urban environments to conserve the biodiversity of Malaysia's natural species, we need to be able to adapt to them, which means that we need to have modern day infrastructure solutions. Those roots growing, let's find unique and interesting ways to allow the roots to go through sidewalks. Like maybe you put like concrete blocks around and then you put the sidewalk on top of that and then the roots can go between or maybe we adapt to the roots. Like if the root is pulling up a sidewalk, we reroute it somewhere else. Just interesting things like that. I once again, need interdisciplinary support to figure out those things. Um, we need to invest in urban foresters and arborists and horticulturists. And, and you know, like a lot of these professions are really popular on the other side of the ocean, but here it's not as glamorous and we don't have enough of them. And you know, the solution is to just hire a contractor out and the contractor goes through and does all the tree work and they find all the apical meristems and they and then the tree's really sad because you cut off its only ability to continue you grow. And then also, like I said, with the leaves, we need to let nature exist. It, it just don't, don't rake everything. Like, just let things be. Like, uh, dead trees, leaves, sticks, all these things are part of the process that we call nature. Nature's on its thing. It's a process. It's a meta process. It's a process of processes that are occurring over time, all the time. So these are some of the basic solutions and uh, the main solution is working together, interdisciplinary, um, letting biologists have a say in. Yeah. Okay, so now let's go to the stakeholders. This one, I am really not what to say. This is not my expertise. Once again, thank you, Amira from UITM for uh, putting this together with me and helping me understand. So. The National Landscape Department, JLN, is the main one that provides all the guidelines to the states. So they do the landscape planning design and uh, planning and planting forms and the tree selection and the reserves. And they created the beautifying Malaysia or the, the process of getting Malaysia to a garden nation. And if you've heard, heard that garden nation before, it's, uh, I think it was first developed by our neighbors in the south, good old Singapore. And they've been like, you know, having a pretty good focus on bringing native species back. But of course, Jalen doesn't have the main control. They can just do the guidelines because all the trees belong to the state, state policy. And here that's kind of DBKL. They own the trees. They are the ones that are kind of in control. And uh, we need to, you know, work with them as best as we can to make them want to help us and to make them want to adapt to the forest. Uh, I don't think I've seen anyone get fierce about protecting KLCC's park, but you know what? I've seen a lot of fierce people at KDCF, I've seen a lot of fierce people at, at uh, Taman Kiara here. Like, people are fierce about their community forests, not so fierce about their parks. So maybe we can, you know, prove that and get, uh, get DBKL to start also helping us get forests in places that there aren't forests. Let's make it a forest city. And then also our private sector, like private sector has been doing a lot of good things. Uh, let's specifically talk about Syme Darby because here at TRSRC, we're having some, some uh, co-working relationship with them. They've developed this uh, Rainforest Knowledge Center. They're allowing us to help them plant out some of their, their um, planting areas and plants and bring some of the species. And also they started a plant to tree program. They've been planting a lot of trees. They released this cool PDF about rare and endangered dipterocarps. Uh, you find that on Google uh, and they've been doing a lot of CSR stuff. And I mean, a lot of different companies have been doing this. I want to thank um, every single company that has ever put any amount of money towards conservation because uh, we need it. We will always need it. And then from the private sector, let's jump into the communities and the NGOs, which is obviously where I'm coming from. m and uh, Free Tree Society, Tropical Rainforest Conservation Research Center. The Habitat Foundation and the Habitat were really great people who were allowing this kind of talks to happen. And uh, so 
like TRCRC and MNS has a lot of, well, MNS is the oldest one. So they're like the four founders. They're the ones that are really pioneering all of this. And they've really helped out and they have a lot of great knowledge and a lot of expertise. And TRCRC has a lot of expertise. And Free Tree Society is a cool, cool little NGO that's like giving out trees for people to go plant out. And um, the only thing that I have to say about them is that I, we, wish they would try to work together with the other NGOs in a more strict way to get native trees because I've seen a lot of like avocados and stuff come out of them. So if we can get native trees into the hands of everyone and people are out there doing minor civil disobedience by guerrilla gardening and planting trees and stuff, that would be cool. Um, not that I advocate doing civil disobedience, but it's cool. Uh, and yeah, so we need a more interdisciplinary approach like I've been saying. Uh, leveraging on the expertise of the NGOs here with the stakeholders from the government side and the private sector who is building things and you know if we can all come together and find the resources and funding to get all these people to work together and to foster their livelihoods so they can continue to contribute to society and nature at the same time it will be a fantastic uh, dependent relationship. And then after the community, we have you guys, just like personnel, what you can do by yourself. You know, you can grab a tree and plant it somewhere, or you can be in the forest with the old oh, app, iNaturalist. It's super cool. You can go out there, and if you learn how to take really good identification pictures by lining up uh, leaves with some sort of uh, coin or a way of figuring out what, what size the leaves are and you are taking note of the orientation of the leaves or the flowers and stuff and taking really cool pictures and uploading them. I'm sure there's like a really big community of foresters and biologists out there that will slowly sift it through. Uh, one of the cool things is like I posted on iNaturalist yesterday because I had a crested goshawk fly up to the eighth story of my office. It just landed on the balcony. I was like, oh, crested goshawk which is a forest species that's been slowly adapting to the urban environment. And if we can bring the forest here, well, then they don't have to adapt as much. So uh, personally, individually, we can't do a lot of the heavy lifting, but together we can advocate and create the pressure, what we need to do to get change and to start to bring in urban forests of native trees, which then helps by becoming a repository of genetic diversity and seeds to continue planting out. Uh, hopefully I got everything done in time. I have more to talk about, I think, and hopefully I was clear and concise. And uh, this is the thank you slide, but really this is the next one, citations, which if you want some of these papers that I've been talking about, you can email me. Um, it's just adam at trcrc.org, pretty simple. On our left is uh, Shoria Macroptera. And then finally, let's end all this with super biodiverse tree trunk. Yeah. So um, it's 8.47, it gives us about, what, 13 minutes to do Q&A, if that's interesting. All right, thank you so much, Adam. Okay, so now we're moving on to the Q&A. If you guys have any questions, do drop it in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Or for those on Facebook, you can just comment in the comment section. Um, we do have one question up here. Okay, for, so a question for Adam. What's your view on guerrilla gardening as part of a potential solution? I, I think it's really cool. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a tough thing to answer diplomatically. I, I think it's part of the solution because you can go in and start introducing biodiversity right now with personal nurseries and stuff, but also it's difficult to want to continue because you have to be careful. Um, some of these species take a very long time and it can be like one to two years until you get ready to go out plant, right? And if you don't know the stakeholders and you don't know the attitude towards uh, you going out and planting those trees, Sometimes that those months of work get removed quite fast. Uh, if you have a completely abandoned plot and or you have friends that have land and are going on, then by all means start planting trees if you can, just because you're going to learn. And the more we learn, the cooler it is, and you get to like have this whole experience of interacting 
with uh, the sapling as it grows up. And of course, the, the, the words are like, you don't plant trees today for yourself, you plant them for the future. Um, and so if you grill a garden and it survives, someone far off from now will have an amazing experience. Hopefully that answered the question without being too controversial. Um, the next question is how to prevent disease of trees. It's really hard. Okay, so this is where I said like investing in arborists and urban foresters because they are going to be ones that are really good at treating diseases. They're going to be able to recognize it. They're going to be able to go on site and uh, throw up a big old rope to the top of the tree and take a really close look and then figure out what they can do and find the solutions for that. And then also genetic diversity. Yeah, just we need it because if you have a big population of trees, there's usually a chance that at least a few of those trees have some sort of mutation which lets them, you know, resist whatever factor is happening to them. And if they do have that, then hopefully they cross pollinate and then you can collect those seeds and then keep planting it. All right. Um slow with the questions okay we if, if you guys have any questions just feel free to ask uh, let me check on facebook let's see uh okay there's this one question uh what what suitable trees to be planted in backyard garden oh that's a really interesting one um hmm. depends how much space you got if you planted a massive 75 meter shoria fagatiana or a dara casalata and your backyard's small, well, in 30 years, you're going to have a problem. But, you know, if you're eating fruits, try to germinate them. I mean, you're, you're already there. You already have the fruits. Just Google what the fruit is and find the species and try to germinate and put it in the yard and see what happens. Uh, right now, in my little yard, I have like 20, 20 mata kuching just like growing up. In the last 15 days, they went from like nothing to a little shoot to like actually having leaves. It's been a really cool kind of like going out there and watering every day. And now that it's rainy season, I'm actually quite sad because I don't have to water it. But at the same time, I'm happy because it saves me about seven minutes of my commute. Uh, but also, if you're in the forest and you run into something that you know, post it iNaturalist, figure out what it is, plant it, germinate it, see what happens. Nice. Okay, we have more questions coming in from Facebook. Uh, from Carol, she asked, uh, may I, uh, can, could you share like your email address again? Yeah, okay. A D A M. Just Adam. My name at trcrc.org. I will do my best to answer every email, but if you get over 200 emails, I might go cry. All right. Next question is from Shaolin. Okay. Does trcrc have any arboris links? Uh, what's one more time? Does trcrc have any arboris links? Uh, not directly, but uh, we have a very wide range of people that work with us and so I think uh, one guy in particular I can think of is over in Sapa his, his name is Unding and uh, he's a super good tree climber and uh, I think that if you have interest in becoming an arborist or learning tree climbing skills you could contact him through Facebook I can put you in touch also there's like Verticale here uh, Verticale is a climbing shop they tend to have some tree climbing stuff every once in a while so once you learn how to climb a tree you just need to go through the whole process of learning everything about tree biology. No big deal, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> any comment on over trimming of urban trees for fear of branches falling on road users or public? Yeah, uh, over trimming is not good. Like I said, the trees trees are <laughs> they can't grow unlimited. Uh, we have to be careful about their marrow stems. This, this is like one of those weird questions that like are really hard to like act, answer accurately. The only way to do this is to have a very strong, robust team of scientists and arborists and geospatial people, GIS technicians, to have these databases. Like, I think Singapore has one. I can't remember what it's called. Maybe it's Prime. But they have like a geospatial information for every single tree they've ever planted. And GIS is super cool. I use GIS almost daily. Um, especially looking at populations of trees and stuff that we've tagged. Uh, it can be done we, with enough observation, with enough field work, with enough like uh, on-site 
like site monitoring, like everywhere we have to continue monitoring and then have our team of arborists go out and fix the problem before it happens. And then even if it does happen, like maybe we can do something in society about insurance. Like if you get whacked on the head by a branch, like you claim it under your insurance or I don't, just be more aware, look up every once in a while. Of Elaine, what is the name of the big tree? I think she's referring to the one on the screen right now. This one, I wasn't sure. I was rushed to get through. I, it could be a dipter carp. It could be a shoria. There are so many shorias. Shoria is one of the coolest genera in uh, in the dipter carps because uh, so we look at timber trees from the timber perspective. So like everything that like we can lump together, we lump together. But actually, biologists who are looking at the shoria complex, we're calling it now the shoria complex. Uh, and we found out that everything that we've been calling a shoria, they're not all like that closely related at all. And they like could be completely different genera. So as the molecular data goes forward and people are, you know, standing on the shoulders of each other to push this science up more, we'll figure out like what's actually shoria and what's not a shoria. Um, this one, like I said, I'm, I'm not the best botanist out there. There's way better botanists than me. I'm, I'm, I need to be humble about it. Like, I work with populations and I, I'm really gifted to work at TRSRC because I have, uh, I have the ability to ask my, my friend and colleague, Din. Uh, Din is an amazing forester from Shingano. He's got like 10 plus years of tromp around the jungle, looking at trees with like the masters. So uh, whenever it comes to like getting down to the species level, I'm always like on the WhatsApp with Din, like, hey, answer me. Um, next question. Uh, how can we non science or non biology or horticulture based learn more about trees, arboriculture, and how to maintain trees properly? Okay, so if you are in those fields, there are a lot of internet resources about propagation, and actually, we need to be better about this. Uh, I know some. Other countries have released some very interesting publications. I think uh, our, our friend here from the Philippines actually is one of my friends. Uh, he has been part of creating a document that really goes through about the uh, vegetative reproduction of trees. And so in Malaysia, maybe we can get to frame or have some up and coming master's student go through and make these publications. I think frame is a really good resource too. They probably know so much more than I can even begin to tell you. Uh, we just need them to, you know, step up and start, start helping us drive this little tree revolution. So just find the, find the right resources and do your best. I mean, with everything that we're doing, it's just, it's just research, 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 research. Like, and then try, 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 try. Uh, because we're in the applied side of science, right? So science itself is this really sweet process of figuring out information through systematic questioning. And then there's people like me who like look at all the people doing all that stuff and be like, oh, I wish I was that smart. And then I'm trying to like make it work on the field. So just research. Okay. Um, next is from Justin. I like the idea of building our infrastructure around trees instead of thinking of them as, as an afterthought. Are there, are there other people in Malaysia that are thinking along these lines or is it still too disruptive an idea? Um, I'm not completely sure. I'm actually working on a private project that is doing that where we're, they're um, talking to me to try to come up with these like ideas of how to like blend the development and the forest so that we don't end up having a complete disconnect. Uh, maybe, maybe Singapore knows a lot about this. Uh, may, they've been working with the trees, so maybe they're doing some interesting things. So uh, a systematic questioning of those guys down there might be helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, I, don't, I really don't know how to answer that question very accurately. Uh, I don't think I did enough research in order to do that. I, I'm sure there are. I, I, I am positive that there are. Um, and if not, like, hey, if there's any young people watching this, like, <laughs> do it. Okay. Um, from Vinita, what are the specific benefits of growing native trees in urban riverine habitats where possible? Urban what? Sorry. Uh, 
Uh oh of urban trees is that they okay well the first thing is we don't need to talk about a benefit they have the right to exist they evolved here they are here intrinsically they have the right to exist we don't have the right to take that that existence away from them so to just not do a disservice to the land that we're on we should be planting native trees either way the other benefits that come from that is that they generally have already unique soil relationships so they can keep the soil as healthy as possible because they are the ones that co-evolved with the microbes in the soil and they're the ones that the soil is made out of uh, all soil is, is inorganic and organic material. And that organic material has to come from somewhere, right? It comes from the native environment, the native fauna and stuff. Also our native, or sorry, native fauna and flora. Our native flora work well with our native fauna. Uh, so if we want to make sure that we're seeing like beautiful birds flying around and hearing songs in the air and you know, not having like a dead city block, uh, we need to plant native trees uh, because the native trees are they, 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 like I said, they're the ecosystem engineers, uh, which is specific attributes of the environment and the niches, the uh, basic, I mean, I'll explain it really. Uh, I've been always taught it's an n-dimensional hyper volume of, of things that an organism can exploit. And, and those those niche okay. um, next is just wondering would it be legal to plant local protected plant species? Sorry, what's that? Okay, from Renee, she asked, um, just wondering would it be legal to plant local protected species yeah i think so I, as long as you're not going out and like cutting the tree down to plant it somewhere else like doing something weird like that um if it's a local protected species just collect the seeds i don't think there's any strong regulations against collecting seeds however if you do go into a state forest reserve you do need permits you can't just go into a forest reserve you gotta you gotta have permits you gotta work with the uh, uh but if you're in like Frim, maybe you can ask the Frim guys if it's okay. Or if you're in Tamantugu 10 years from now when something fruits, I think they'll be okay with you going out planting it somewhere else. So you can ask them. Um, planting the tree, I don't think is illegal. Don't think there's anything illegal with that. Holding the seeds, I'm a biologist, not a legislator, but I also don't think there's anything illegal with that. Uh, exploiting the tree itself like you're trying to get a vegetative propagal so you free climb up 15 years and then cut a branch down i don't recommend that at all because well unless you're an arborist you shouldn't be climbing trees it's dangerous um can i answer the the question from adrian just quick here he's asking about uh, programs in malaysia all right so um adrian asked about the are there any programs in Malaysia about conserving forest genetic resources, i.e. cloning, seed orchards, etc.? If there are, could you please tell some of the best practices? Yeah, okay. So I can answer part of that question. Are there programs conserving genetics? Yes. TRCRC is doing living rainforest collections. Like this is a little plug for the NGO, right? Uh, they are going state by state, working with the state forestry to, to develop these areas of essentially living gene banks. So we try to collect as much of the seeds as we can of the different carps, and then we plant them out in a specific way so that like species are far enough to not cross contaminate with their pollen. And eventually, hopefully in 30, 50 years, they grow up and become a stable seed source to do restoration in the individual states. Um, one of the most, the, our most advanced one right now is in Sabah. It has got some funding by Simon Darby actually, and they are doing a great job and I'm sure that they would love to have visitors and volunteers and donations and stuff. Uh, they are working mostly on propagating from seed or from wild saplings. We are not quite at the cloning stage yet, which, you know, if we're talking about genetic resources, cloning might not be the best way anyway, unless you're very responsible about it. Uh, and just to move on and answer the other question, things like mahogany, oh, they're not so bad because they don't spread as much. But one of the things that really pain in my keister, my rear end, the things I don't like at all is acacia mandu. Uh, it was a tree from Australia, a legume, a weird legume, 
that was brought in to basically restore soil and try to stabilize slopes. And uh, if you have a blue car forest, it will invade and absolutely dominate. It is such a fast growing, vicious, evil tree. Uh, they just create stands of themselves. It's frustrating to like walk through them. And I mean, I, I was like, I was in one little like dom like a uh, Keisha Man Gym dominated area. And then uh, I saw like one Shoria, Shoria Leprosola, Maranti Timbaga sapling is about like two and a half meters. And I just like, come on, man, you can do it grow faster but of course it won't and the worst part too is they're not adapted to our soil so what happens is uh, uh <laughs> they get big 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 and then they die like right away and then they fall over and then yeah it's just it's annoying can you describe urban tree transplant yeah so the next question is can you describe urban tree transplant uh team of urban authority i see one tree transplant so I'm not so sure about this. Actually, I'm, I would not say that I've ever seen that happen here. Uh, I've seen it happen in the, in the States. Uh, it was cool. They, like, they get this huge, giant machinery and it like, it like digs deep down and it, like pulls up the whole root ball. And then it's like a whole team of people and big trucks like move to the city. Uh, I'm sure you can find a lot of these things on YouTube, but I don't know how it actually would work us. And I think it would be very difficult thing to do and require a lot of research and a lot of careful planning. Uh, I think it would be really important to make sure that there's enough, uh, enough staking and tension to keep the tree up while the roots regenerate. And I think it also depends on the species. Like I said, this is a mega diverse country and different trees are going to react differently to different things. And like I said, and if you have like <laughs> some trees dying because some guy runs over the root with the heavy machinery, well, I, I don't know how well they'll do with a transplant, like a big transplant. But of course, like I said, I'm not that knowledgeable on this particular question. I think that this is best directed towards the authorities at FRIM and horticulturists and people that work most closely with their urban environment. Like I wanna advocate for urban environment and but the way that I would do, a way that I would be able to best help out in that aspect is actually not to move things around, but to uh, either try to identify wildlife corridors next to other forest reserves and then design planting plants for existing parks and stuff and maybe help like do some seed collection and then any new development that occurs, uh, finding a new way to do development instead of like raising the land and then like trying to clean everything up from scratch, but rather like uh, being careful and where you develop and how you develop. And then instead of like, you know, creating a park later, like maybe leave a bit of forest as a park that will exist after the development's done. All right, so we have another two more questions from Facebook. From Joshua, it was found that some of urban tree roots appeared on the surface of the soil. Can you explain why it happened the way? It's desperately searching for nutrients. Um, if, if, you're, if you have roots on the topsoil, the closer up it is, is because below it's barren. Like I said, we, we, it rains here so much and a lot of the nutrients and vitamins and stuff are water soluble and so those nutrients disappear and it means that everything that is available or is kind of happening at the surface. So it's actually completely normal for roots to be on the surface. Uh, I saw one tree in the Anacardaceae family called Campnosperma aurticalata. It was huge, big tree and it had one of these really cool ladder roots and it went off like, it must have been over 20 meters. It was, imagine, imagine a root like, like, like this big and then just like running along the side of a, of a hill for a very long time. Uh, so I think it's, it's normal to have roots on top because like I said, the, the way that the um, soil ecology works here is that the nutrient turnover is very fast. It happens shallowly, it happens near the surface and the competition for those nutrients is stiff. All right, so uh, last question I think here from Balkis. He said, I live close to a mountain forest and I noticed a Dipteropop seed landing nearby my garden. Can you share tips how to recognize a Dipteropop tree? Okay, Dipterocarps are kind of relatively easy to recognize. If you can find the leaf pattern, so a lot of them, when they drop their leaves, their leaves are very, very, very thick. And so they'll, they'll start flat, uh, like a fresh leaf will be flat. And by the time it dries up, it'll peel. And in some species, it kills quite strongly. In some, it kills a little bit. 
but it's thick. Like imagine like a really high quality piece of paper. So the dipterocarps leaves are quite thick. They're always alternate. Like they, they branch alternately, which means that you don't, you don't opposite. It's like doop, doop, doop. And they have, a lot of them have very strong stipules. You can look that up. It's like the part, it's the vegetative part that subtends a new leaf. Um, and they tend to be ridged or deeply, uh, the, the veins are very, how do I explain this simply? It's like a, you can feel it. It's like very thick and sandpapery. And when you run your thumb on the under, underside near the leaf rib, you can feel all the individual veins up and down. And then sometimes in the, the, if you flip the leaf over near the rib, you'll find these like uh, little thick uh, like formations. They're like little glands. And occasionally in the young plants, if you look at the top of the leaf, there'll be these little blue resin glands. And this in Vatica, another Diptocarps and the Diptocarpaceae family, these happen on the sides. And then in some of the other species, it kind of happens diffusely through it. Uh, they don't flower frequently. Like uh, they flower like every five to seven years. They're a weird plant. Like they're gonna wait around for a very long time and they're gonna be like just chilling in the forest. And then once all of the, the environmental conditions are met, usually from the Southern Oscillation of the El Nino, which is called La Nina, I believe. Uh, they all go, oh, it's time to go. And then they all flower out and the whole forest is just altered immensely for a little bit. And then they all drop their seeds and the seeds are big and they're winged and they're beautiful and different species or different genera have different amounts of wings and some don't have any wings at all. And then they slowly just whoo, to the bottom. Um, if you're in a primary rainforest and you're looking out on the forest and you see crowns of trees that are like different colors, gray, I think the scientific term is glaucus, and they're clumped, they're all dipped to a cars. <laughs> they're, you, it's amazing. Uh, a healthy forest contains an absurd amount of dipped to uh, So that's kind of like the main ways. Uh, I could talk a lot about dipped because they're super cool. But yeah, just leaf arrangement, leaf quality, and the seeds, like the, the fruit, sorry, the fruit is unmistakable. Oh, and they even have a cauliflower top, like a, they don't, they don't, sorry, sorry, some, they don't, like, uh, they don't like do this normal like pine tree thing. They have like this really cool, crazy, like cauliflower top, the canopy formation that is. All right, so I think so that's all the questions that we have that, uh, yeah, we have addressed like all of the questions that were asked. So thank you so much, Adam, for the very informative and wonderful session. All right, and also thank you everyone for staying with us throughout the session. Now we will share the QR code on the screen for feedback. We really appreciate it if you could scan the QR code and give us your thoughts on the series. This online workshop is also recorded, so it will be up on the social media platforms very soon. Next week on 11 September at 8 p.m., we will be with Miss Jolene from Language Project Penang on Citizen Science. So mark the date in your calendar. Before we end, if you are interested in learning more about Tropical Rainforest Conservation and Research Center, you can follow them on their social media accounts. On Instagram, it's at trcrc underscore org. At Facebook, it's trcrc.org. And also, you can check out their website at um, www.trcrc.org. And also email Adam, um, adam at trcrc. Yep. And then, uh, and, oh, sorry? Can I add a couple more things? Yeah. Sure. Another thing is if you ever have any questions about TRCRC, you can email TRCRC by just going to the, just typing in ASK, ask at TRCRC. And then also, yeah, do follow us on our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Urban Biodiversity Initiative at ubi underscore my, that's ubi underscore my, and also do check out our website, ubi-my.com. So that is all from us. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you guys next week. Yeah.